All right, I want to welcome everyone to another session of our monthly Marketing Center of Excellence Masterclass. I'm Lane Houck, your co-host, and with me today is Lynn, my other co-host. How you doing, Lynn? I am fantastic, Lane. How are you today? Very good. Thank you. Hope you had a great Christmas holiday. Very much. And yourself? Really good, actually. It was just nice and restful with the family. We didn't travel. We didn't have actually any family in town. I think it was maybe the first Christmas I can remember where we didn't have anybody in town. We didn't go anywhere. It was just the four of us, and we just enjoyed each other's company and enjoyed the downtime. We had a we had a great Christmas in our new home. I did cook a lot, which, you know, for the family, which can be a little stressful. I cooked three or four big meals this week, but, uh, but it was great to have everybody over here, and uh, that was a really nice um, Christmas. Yeah, you wouldn't be Louisiana or Cajun if you didn't cook on Christmas. I was, my actually, my wife's family is from Louisiana, Baton Rouge. Oh. They're all alumni from LSU. Very um, cool. So yeah, the Cajun cooking and sh- crab and shrimp boils and all that stuff—that's definitely part of the culture for sure. Very nice. I want to welcome everyone who's also with us today. I hope you all had a great holiday weekend and also had a restful time enjoying it with time, the time with family and friends. Appreciate your time today while you have taken time out of the maybe a kind of a holiday week. It's a weird week where we have a full work week here in between two holiday weekends. It's usually Christmas falls in the middle of the week and it breaks everything up a little bit. But uh, anyway, we're going to dive right in today. We're going to, we're uh, as you probably have heard, we're going to talk about content part two. Last month, we talked about content because it was, it was, a, it was actually my planned first topic as we launched this masterclass. And it was ended up being timely. Lynn and I were just discussing it. It ended up being very timely, a trending topic regarding content. And then this last month happened and more happened. Google released, released the announcement of the addition of experience to EAT. So we now have EAT. And then we also had Google also released, released sorry, the, the Google Spam link update for December. So they've Google Spam Brain is working double time to try and detect spam links, um, SEOs trying to game the system, so to speak. So it also happened here in December. I also had a lot of feedback and questions follow up from last month about how do we really implement authorship into our strategy? So we'll maybe recap a little bit about that as well. And then if we have time, we'll do some live demos again, because I wanted to show you another tool that I'm using along with on-page AI and some of the chat GPT things that we're experimenting with as this new tool has taken the marketing world by storm. And I honestly think it's taking a lot of more than the marketing world by storm. It's really taking the world by storm. There's a lot of talk out there about what's what AI is going to do and what it's going to, how it's going to influence and change our world. Lynn, anything on this quick agenda here you want to pitch in on? No, I think this is this is great. I'm excited to talk about the experience part of EAT. I'm excited to talk about some of the AI tools, maybe ChatGPT and some of those things. So I'm looking forward to fitting into it. Awesome. All right. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I did leave a link here to the spam link update, the official announcement on Google Developer Blog. But it's utilizing Google's AI-based spam prevention system. They term it spam brain to nullify unnatural links. Unnatural links would be any link that they determined that was purposely placed, paid for, but not necessarily, but not noted as a sponsored link. Things like that, where you're trying to game the system and move the needle in SEO. They want it all to be organically. So if someone picks up my content or links to my content, they want that to be 100% organic and just because my content is great. Now, That doesn't mean that you can't make great content and syndicate it, distribute it, promote it, market it everywhere to try and get people to pick it up. And that, I think, is the underlying premise of SEO is creating great content and then doing all the things that you can do from a marketing standpoint to get that content in front of the target audience. The spam link update is actively rolling out. So we're sitting here in the middle of an active rollout of the spam link update. So... That Google said that they expect it to finish by the end of the year. The helpful content system is also still rolling out. That has been uh, what I have seen and what I've heard with kind of fingers on the pulse, ears to the ground, so to speak, is that we're continuing to see the SERPs change. We're continuing to see certain sites get hit with that site-wide signal. In fact, I talked to a couple of agencies this last week whose clients' websites, one of them had been hit. Uh, by the content, the helpful content rollout. It was very obvious in in October, uh, actually it was in November. 
in November, you could see it just it just fell off the traffic. It was like a cliff. When we evaluated the site, there was a lot of duplicate content from primarily meted out into location pages. So the location pages on the site were just full of duplicate content. There were about 30 of them. And those duplicate content pages were collectively were more than the rest of the site. I was pretty obvious to me. I'm like, man, this is a helpful content site-wide signal. All those duplicate content pages were flagged. The whole site got flagged and the traffic just literally fell off a cliff. Yeah, uh, interesting. So, I think uh, I'm sorry to interrupt there, but no, but I think I know who you're talking about. And I, I got to be honest, I would have argued with anyone, I, and I have argued with anyone that duplicate content penalty doesn't exist. I would have argued that that duplicate content penalty was designed to stop guys like you and me from building ten sites all trying to hit the same keywords, and it didn't exist across one single site until I saw this site. It's the first time in my life, in my 25-year SEO career, that I've seen a penalty like this. And it, and it perfectly correlates with the helpful content update. I don't know. It's a tiny bit anecdotal, but it's the first time I've seen anything like it. And I think it was, number that, that I'm just trying to... I saw several sites down. And to, to Liz's point, I've seen more than one of these in the last, say, month or two. Because of how our work with multiple agencies, I just get more agencies coming to me than than that, the, than probably all of you do, and so it's like it's you get a kind of a little bit more of a macro view, and I've seen at least a half a dozen sites that have that kind of hallmark cliff, and it was between September October where that started to happen. Combined with the helpful content update and the new E and Eat, we have a lot of changes, notwithstanding the spam link update, which Google has been constantly at war with. So. Just as a recap, helpful content is people-first content that demonstrates EAT. And I say that because Google has really reinforced that in their announcements and some of the interviews that since this is all, and even before Google released the E experience in EAT, uh, just last month we were talking about EAT and how important it was in, term, in terms of identifying helpful content. And, and this really gets worked it's works its way into the quality guidelines. So you can really see eat and the new e experience in eat when you get into the new release of the quality guidelines. So if you read those quality guidelines, you can really see it in many different ways how they're instructing the raters to use eat as a framework for identifying helpful content that's going to pass the mustard test, especially if it's ranking on page one. Now, we know not every page of content is going to be reviewed by a human quality content rater. That's just, it's not feasible. But if you're linking on page one, and it's for a competitive term, I would absolutely expect a quality rater to, to hit that page at some point, because that's what they're all about. So if your goal is to get to page one with a page of content, then you need to also remember that or you know, that's what we talked about, I think last month is writing your content for all three audiences. Okay. So remember, we need to write our content specifically for humans. Obviously it's going to miss the mark. If it's, even if you rank on page one, ultimately the goal is to get a human being to hit that page and then convert into a lead. If the content is so off, even if it ranks, if it's not going to hit the human beings in the target audience in a way that is going to cause at least some conversion opt or conversion ratio, then what good is it really, right? Unless you're just running AdSense or something like that. Write it for the manual quality rater, just to talk about that, then write it for the bot. And I think you can do all three of these inside of an article and inside of the process of writing an article. So the question now is, the question of the day is, how do we demonstrate this new E experience in our content? And I'm, I think it's probably the question... An answer is probably pretty obvious, but we'll get into some specifics here. Number one, I really think LinkedIn is going to be a great place to do this. Link link to your LinkedIn profile. Have links to certifications or diplomas that you might have. List awards and recognitions. And again, you can do all of this within your LinkedIn profile. If I'm a quality rater and I'm assigned to go evaluate a page of content and I identify an author which is number one, the job number one of a quality rater is to determine who's responsible for the content. That's their first job. 
And so if they can't identify a human, then they're going to fall back to the company or the entity that hosts that website. But if it can go to a human, a human being, an author, an individual, which is better, that's the best practice here, then I'm going to go look and see, does this person have a LinkedIn profile? I'm going to just Google search their name as an author. What is their experience? What do I find? And so if you go and Google your name, if you Google Lane Houck, if you Google my name, my LinkedIn profile is going to pop up right in the top three or four results. It makes it easy then for somebody to then go and validate what is my experience? What are my certifications? What are my awards or recognitions? What are my skill endorsements on my LinkedIn profile, which is a really good indicator of experience, right? If other people are saying, hey, this guy is good at SEO, this gal is really good at whatever, those third-party skill endorsements will really help demonstrate experience. I also like the author site as a hub. So, you know, if you go to lanehauk.com, you'll see I have like an author individual site that can also serve as a hub, a link, a link hub. I can link out to my other author profiles. I can link to the different sites that I'm an author for or that I have ownership in those companies and things like that. There, Lynn, on experience? I think... A lot of this, I know you're going to get into this a little more, but yeah, the experience of the user, you got to think about things like, I don't know if you wrote an article about skydiving, for example, yet you've never skydived. You know, I think that experience shines through in the content. I don't know how well they would rank something where you don't have experience in the topic. And so I think with entities, they can tie all of those things together and build a profile on you and the authorship is just really important. Yeah, agreed. And this too, there's a question here that Mike's asking that's relative here. So Mike's asking, is there, for WordPress sites, is there a recommended plugin to add for the author bio? So understand that by default, WordPress is going to give you an author page if you set it up properly. And so you can go to my author page. You can see it right here. It's slash author slash Lane Hauk. And it's going to have all the articles that I have authored here on my author page. Okay. This is this happens by default with WordPress. So you don't even need a plugin for this. Certainly, you I haven't that's a good question. I haven't experimented or looked for other plugins that might take authorship to another level inside WordPress. But ultimately, I just want to have links for the bot to see, hey, this is these are all the different articles that I've written. I actually will send links to this page here, Mike, to as part of your questions. In my articles, I will link to my author pages and then. One other component to this is I would definitely put about the author at the bottom of your article somewhere. It's a long article, you can see. But, you know, and then this is where you can link to other places, other your author profiles, other company sites, what have you. Here I'm going to my LinkedIn profile. Here I'm going to my personal site. Here I'm going to my podcast page. And so I'm just leading the bot and creating connections to all of my other profiles or at least some of them, if you want. Yeah, that's what I would do as far as just authorship and linking out to other authorship profiles, which I'll get into more in a second here in the slides. Quick next screen here. All right. Let's talk about AI. This has been a subject of great passion, debate, wonder, I think, just at the new chat GPT tool, amazement. And so over the last several weeks, there's been some pretty healthy debates about this. If you do have questions about AI, we'll try to connect them or answer them when we're as we're going through this or at the end. Please understand my own disclaimer here. I am by no means a, an expert, or nor do I have a crystal ball, and none of us do. So this is a, an emerging trend. This is an emerging technology. It's an emerging issue. And I think it's an emerging opportunity. But no one has the crystal ball on where this all goes. And I think specifically, a lot of us want to know what's Google's stance on this? Like, how is this going to work itself into the game of SEO, content marketing, client work, and all of that? And again, I don't necessarily have like solid answers for you on everything, but we'll try and present to you guys some of the different pieces of, of information around this topic. So first of all, I want you to see what Steve Toth has said about this. This is just a couple of days ago. Um, I follow Steve. He's a really smart guy. He's been in the SEO game, seonotebook.com, really good resource there. And so I'm just going to read it really quick so you guys, uh, just for the sake of discussion. 
He said, today I asked G chat GPT to create FAQs related to a topic using certain keywords. Then I asked it to create FAQ schema based on those Q&As. Then I asked it to insert a CTA link using specific anchor text in the schema answers and it did it exceptionally well. It passed schema validation with ease. Am I going to use this in my content? Maybe. Before I do that, I need to improve the AI writing detection score, and I will measure the score for the overall page with the FAQs added. Overall, and this is what I want to focus on, this is a huge time saver. You can quickly add keywords to FAQ sections in order to improve your scores on tools like Surfer Phrase, Pop, and on page AI, and even G Score. I like utilizing FAQs for the, this purpose because they can go on just about any page and there's no need to edit existing content. The key is training writers to rewrite the content so it passes AI detection. Okay, this is what I've been experimenting with. And I know Lynn's been too, so we can both add here. But what I've been ex experimenting with is my feeling, and this again, this is an opinion here right now, is that straight out content coming from the chat GPT tool, if it just copy paste, I have a strong feeling that's not going to do well in SEO most of the time. Again, we're going to have to test that. My strong feeling is that AI content from a chat GPT-like tool that has a writer that is prompting it, rewriting it, and just massaging it to really put that human element in it is going to be fantastic. Both opinions right now. So there are some predecessors here. I've used both Jasper and ScaleNut. We actually got rid of Jarvis Jasper about six months ago, went to ScaleNut because we found it to be have better outputs. We just canceled ScaleNut. We're now using ChatGPT with on-page AI and a couple of other tools to just produce better content. In our white label agency, we are not using any AI generated content at all right now in any of our SEO campaigns. I haven't gone in, on the bandwagon and just switched over all of our content to AI content. We're not doing that. We still have all of our writers. What I'm trying to focus on here is, can we train our writers to rewrite content so it passes AI detection while saving them time? And the jury's still out on that right now. I don't know. Any other, any inputs there, Lynn? I think like anything else, this is a tool. Google is very good at spam detection. They always have been. Of course, there's exceptions and some people get away with things for a while. And I think we have to keep framing this in the idea that we're not sure how this is going to go. I am I think about some of the old ways to generate content and people were just building bots to build tons and tons of content and a bot isn't the right word for it back then. But those that content, one, wasn't helpful. And I think that's probably the most important piece that we're talking about here. At the end of the day, Google wants to deliver the best result to their end user. They want user experience to be off the charts. They want you to type the search phrase in Google and they want you to find the answer that you want immediately. And so they're constantly trying to deliver the best result. Now, we I would never take a Jasper or chat GPT output and throw it up on a page and expect it, expect no issues. I We have a team of writers. We use the tools for prompts. We use the tools for concepts and ideas and outlines and basically beat writer's block in some cases. I use it to be to be writer's block in a lot of cases. Man, how what's the best way for me to say this thing that I want to say? And the better you get at writing the prompts and the better you get at feeding information into it, the better your output will be. Now, uh, a couple of caveats. Obviously, here, the one of the potential risks that we're looking at here is that the chatbots based on GPT, they may not always produce accurate or appropriate responses. They're not able to understand context all the time or the intention behind a user's message in a way that a human would. It's This can cause inappropriate responses, incorrect responses, incorrect information, false information, and it may confuse your reader. And ChatGPT, it was originally designed as, a, as, an, as, a, as an actual chat bot. And one of the problems with a chat bot is trying to sell this chat bot as the as if you were speaking to a live human. And so I think there's the combination of human 
using tools is the best way that we're doing it now. And I think that's probably the, the only appropriate way at the moment. Really good input there. And what, when, what Lynn said, and I think is really important, is ultimately what Google's looking for is original, helpful content. Let's not get more crazy than that and understand that what, that's what we need to produce for our clients, if we're an agency, for ourselves and our own companies or agencies is produce original, helpful content. So definitely use Copyscape or something like that to make sure that you're number one putting out original content because that's the other risk here is that more and more people as it use the chat GPT tool, a lot of this content is going to be, if especially if you use it, copy and paste, you're going to have duplicate content or a lot of it. So just be aware of that as well. But ultimately I referred to this, the, this section of the Google spam policies in terms of content goes. So spammy automatically generated content is the issue. Okay. Spammy content is an issue. Spammy automatically generated content is an issue. All right. What is auto-generated content? It's gen content that's been generated programmatically without producing anything original or adding sufficient value. So if you look at this second point here, text translated by an automated tool without human review or curation before publishing. All right. If I take a chat GPT output and I put my own human curation and review into it, and I add my own experience to that output, that is a completely acceptable output to Google under their spam policies. It does not say you can't use ChatGPT or Jarvis or any other tool. It just says if you're just trans, if you're outputting it programmatically from a tool and there's no human involved in that, you're just copying and pasting and publishing, then that's an issue. I think where the rubber meets the road with this is going to be an AI detection tools and trying to figure out at what percentage of content is it, and this is what I'm experimenting with, because I think this is really where the rubber meets the road from an SEO standpoint is at what level is that content percentage wise going to be deemed to be not human, human, it's going to be human curated content, even though you can detect some AI content in the page, was there sufficient human review and curation to make it useful, helpful, and original? Does that make sense? I don't know that there's going to be a bright line here, guys. There's definitely no like line in the sand that Google says, here's the line. And if you cross it, you're in, you've, you're not going to get penalized. And if you stay on this side of the line, you won't. It's definitely, and that's why I said it's not a black and white issue here, a good or a bad issue. It really is about curating and having humans involved. So I think that if you if you use it with humans involved and Lynn said, if you use it to frame things out, if you use it to produce content briefs, FAQs, and then get a human involved to curate it and apply their own experience to it, then I think it's going to be a great tool for marketing agencies to use in their overall strategies. Lynn? We've always thought about some of the most famous copywriting books are or talk about putting your yourself in the mind of the consumer, you know, where they are. And so answer the questions that your visitors have answer, determine which questions they might have about your product, about your services. And so I love the use of FAQs on pages. I love the being able to add an FAQ to the bottom of, of clients' pages where they've just written content of basically about themselves. So we often go to our clients' pages and do a quick search for the word we. Those pages aren't helpful when they just talk about themselves. They're customer, they're not customer focused, they're business focused. And so Building your content focused around the needs of your customer, the pain of your customer, the desires of your customer is helpful content. And that's always the frame that we take with our content. And then again, we use these sort of AI tools as, heck, we, we do keyword research. We're like, hey, what are the best keywords? Hey, what are the best questions? Hey, what are the best? And then we use that and put that together in a combination and create great content that is helpful to the visitor. David just asked, what tool are you using for AI detection? I am currently using uh, on-page AI. And you can go here to AI detection and you can plug in your URL. So you have to publish the content first in order to, in order to run the URL uh, against the AI detection. And then you can, and it'll give you an output based on what it finds. So you can see here it found 5.5% AI. We're good to go. 
Again, this is the percentage that I'm having to figure out and experiment with and just see you know, how it does. But I'm using on-page AI. I do have a link to a new, a new tool here called Glitter. It stands for Giant Language Model Test Room. It's run out of uh, some people from Harvard and IT, IBM Watson Lab. And this is a free tool and you can input your text here and it'll analyze it as well. But I am using on-page AI for this purpose, David. And I think it does a really good job. And I'm just, I'm running my article, I'm publishing it. And then I'm checking it against AI detection. I'm using some AI to help me frame out FAQs, other things like that, a content brief. And then I fill in using human plus other AI tools as well. And then just experimenting with it. I can't say that I feel like I'm saving a lot of time yet. I do feel like I am, but I don't, I haven't, I don't have a before and after experiment. Here's an article I wrote completely from scratch on my own. And here's one that I wrote with AI assistance. I but do ready, feel like I'm producing better content, content, at least in the same amount of time. Go ahead, Lynn. I was just going to ask you, but are you writing more helpful content? I think I am. I think you are too. If you look at this article here, again, I don't know that's going to rank on page one because I'm going against these giants, search engine land, search engine journals. So we'll see. Marketing COE is a really, it's a brand new domain. It's only, it doesn't even have one DA yet. So I'm working on my, getting my DADR, my authority page rank score up. But so whether this ranks on page one for this article of content, I don't know. But if you go through and read this article here, this is going to give you a re really good idea of what EAT is all about. Is it all mine? No, I've used some from me, some from some AI tools, some from Google directly in terms of their own guidelines and what have you, and some quotes from other authorities like Search Engine Land. So just understand that. But yeah, on page AI. Okay, where are we here? AI tools. So I yeah, I wanted to, I do have a link in here to, and I put it in chat here as well, how to spot AI generated text. I think this is a really good article. I would encourage you to read it. It doesn't make a determination one way or the other. It just talks about the whole concept and principle of AI generated content or text, how our detection tools are working and all that. But it has good links in here to other resources as well. So would highly recommend you read that article as part of your overall, just looking into this whole concept. All right. The next slide here. Okay. So content strategies. I just, I put this picture in here. That's a tweet from Danny Sullivan because I think it's appropriate. We haven't said AI content is bad. We've said pretty clearly content written primarily for search engines rather than humans is the issue. That's what we focused on. If someone fires up 100 humans to write content just to rank or fires up a spinner or AI, it's the same issue. So original, helpful content for humans or people first content. Okay. And so I think there's a really good place for these tools to be used for research, framing, assistance to create even better content. So when it comes to your content strategy, number one, you've got to have some tools in your toolbox. All right. Like any plumber, electrician, contractor, if you don't have the right tools, you're not going to get the job done right, or it's going to take you a lot longer. So if you're going to write great content or your writers are going to write content, arm your writers with these tools. Like our writers are armed with these tools and I'm providing some more training for them on how to use the tool, the research tools to help write great content in a maybe a little bit more efficient manner. Look at, I think, your strategy in terms of producing content series versus content pieces. I think too much Agencies are looking at the content month in and month out as just a piece of content, just an article. We do art, one article a month, we do three articles a month, whatever it might be, and it's just articles, there's just pieces. I think if you take a step back and look at an overall topic or topic cluster, you and you look at just framing it in your own mind as we're going to write a whole series of content around this topic cluster, I think you'll actually see a better strategy laid out, a little bit more thought into what articles are put out when, and you can bring your users along in a series of the complete guide to home plumbing. <laughs> Why couldn't you as a plumber or as an agency for a plumber, write a complete guide to residential home plumbing, and then just in a series, start to bring out all the different topics 
and issues around residential home plumbing that are going to be great pieces of content for a user, guarantee the bot will like things like that as well. Just on a, maybe a little bit of a shift in your thinking of looking at your content strategy more as a series around topic clusters versus just individual pieces of content each month. If you're going to do this and th think like this, it will require more of a plan or an outline or a brief versus just throwing content up every single month without really any overarching plan or strategy. I also think that if you look at content planning at quarterly versus monthly, you'll also start to look at this more as a series versus pieces. People first content written for humans is going to have really good instruction and really good practical applications. Again, I think we've talked about this and we've seen it in some of the other people that have mentioned it, FAQs, the questions that people have are really good to include in your content. So what are some other tools that you can use for writing or framing out content? We've talked about chat GPT. Another tool I'm experimenting with, which I really kind of is text cortex. It's a, they got a Chrome extension that you can run. I'll show you that here in a second. And then InLinks is a really cool tool, especially used with chat GPT. On-page AI is a lot, there's some really good similarities between InLinks and on-page AI, but InLinks has a really cool tool I'm gonna show you here in a second that I just have loved to start experimenting with. Before I get into that live demo, is there any, Lynn, you wanna say anything about our previous slide there on content strategies? No, I think we're, I think we're hitting the marks there. Um... I know I we got some questions too, so I want to hit these questions yeah, too. Yeah, there's a few questions in here that maybe we could that we could hit really quick too. Mark asked it, what happens if you take on a client that has older blogs that were written by someone else? Would you run them through a tool before deploying the old blogs into a new site? Yeah, I would definitely run through Copyscape because if they've been indexed, then that original content is going to be attributed to a different canonical or potentially even a different entity. Run the art, the blow. If those blog articles are just sitting there and they've never been indexed, yeah, which is possible, then great. Then, but run them through Copyscape and you'll know. Yeah. And the other question is that content useful? Is it helpful? Is it good content? And whether that's a tool or just some human interaction, is that still in line with, does that support uh, any other pages on the site? Do they actually have any links in it or did they, is it purposeful? Because, you know, just writing content just to write content is no longer the way to do things. Probably never was. Yeah, 100%. Let's see. Carol's got a couple of, she was, she talked to the people at online. On page on AI. AI. Looks like. Yeah, I had tried to, I had tried Carol to paste text in there and it didn't work. So maybe they fixed it in the last week or so. I'll try it again now instead of having to just plug the URL in. I had the same experience as you, Lane. Yeah. Uh, and then let's see, if you're writing an article about a topic you aren't an expert in, AI should speed the process. Yes. I think that it's. We use these tools to find the questions and find the answers that we really need to, I don't know, it's good research. What are the top 10 things I need to know about X topic? What are the five most important things that I need to know about Y? And so those are always, that's how we use the tools. It's research for us. Yes. Okay. So Don, his next question there is leading right into authorship here. So Don says, so should we have an authorship page, main things to have on that? So let's talk about authorship. And then we'll do a live demo to, to, to final to finish out today. I cannot understate this, okay? You cannot fire authorship schema signals without a people type, okay? Yes, content can be attributed to a company, not a person, but that is not the ideal situation. It's not what Google wants. It's not what a quality rater is instructed to do, but it is a fallback position. So if a piece of content, a page of content, is not attributed to a person, it's not authored by an individual that's clear and delineated, then it then the fallback position is a company, but you can't even fire schema signals around authorship around a company. It needs a person. And Google wants to find an individual tied to the page that is responsible for the content. So the only question I would ask is, why not do that? Why not feed Google exactly what it wants? So this just takes a little extra setup. It's not a lot. And you can certainly go, you can do a little, you can do a little more, you can do a lot, or you can do a lot more with authorship. The basic things are like, number one, WordPress has authorship built in. I already showed you that. As soon as you set up a user in a website, all right, that user equals an author, okay? 
whether that user slash author is ever attributed to content like I'm doing here, that's intentional by you when you hit the publish button. Is Are you making the author, the user responsible for that content? Okay. That author page is automatically created by WordPress. Certainly there's things you can do to enhance this. It sounds like there's a really cool plugin that someone mentioned that in the comments that sound like it might be worth looking into. But ultimately, authorship is an individual that has experience and expertise and authority, preferably in a topic or a set of topics, okay? And so by leading Google on a path, you can start to, to frame it out for Google. Here's my experience. Here's my expertise. And just ultimately connect content to an individual. That's the big, that's the big thing. And when you're publishing content, make sure it's tied to an individual. If you really want to fill out the authorship profile properly, then have that individual, that author, also have a Gravatar profile, okay? So Gravatar, Gravatar.com. In order to have a Gravatar profile, you have to have a WordPress.com profile. So you got to go to WordPress.com, create a free profile there, and then you can use that profile to, to get a Gravatar profile. Gravatar is what WordPress uses in its default status for authorship. And so when I go into my website and I put in lane at lanehope.com, which is what my Gravatar profile is assigned to, WordPress will automatically pull in my author picture and other details about my authorship profile directly from Gravatar. So if you're going to do a basic authorship profile and you're using a WordPress site, I would say get a WordPress.com free profile, fill out your Gravatar profile as fully as you can with links and phone numbers and all that. And then use that same email address as the user account on your WordPress site. And then assign that user the author of the content that you're providing. That would be a most basic setup of authorship. Okay. Can you do more? Yes. So you can have about me's, link trees. You can have an Amazon author profile if you publish on Amazon. And so I've already started creating ebooks and publishing them to Amazon. I can do so now. I figured out how to get an ebook published in a couple of hours. Literally, it only takes a couple of minutes, but you know, from submission to review to it's approved, it's live on Amazon Kindle a couple of hours. And you can use great tools like Chat GPT to write ebooks. And in this case, an ebook, I don't really care about SEO nearly as much on an ebook. I'm more writing it for my target audience for leveling up my own authority in the space as a published author, et cetera, et cetera. But you can have these different author profiles that Google can find. And certainly if you send a do follow link to one of these, those are great ways to get them indexed or use an indexer. And then you're just going to make more connections. Every link that you have out in the World Wide Web is a potential connection. Links to links, connections, create those links purposely for Google to find. Other profiles that you can have on other platforms that will help expand your authorship profile are all these great content forms that you can have your profiles on. So LinkedIn, again, I'm going to say that's number one. Without any doubt, have a LinkedIn profile, fill it out, complete it, push the envelope on it because it's a great resource. But all these other places are really good places to have your content on. And so you can use IFTT to automate publication of your content to all these other profiles. Just IFT is the automation platform. You trigger it maybe off of your blog RSS feed, and then all of that content gets automatic, automatically syndicated or published to your other author profiles, okay? Just what, walk through that. I think it's important to make sure that if you're setting up an authorship profile, that you make sure it's a unique brand or author name. Confusion is your enemy in SEO. If you have a unique, if you have a, a common name, Lynn Askin, Lane Howe, those are really unique names, right? I don't have to really worry about too much there. But if your your name is Stephen Miller, okay, you might want to consider making your name unique, like Stephen A. Miller. You use your middle initial, or Stephen Miller, Stephen A. Miller, comma. MBA, if you have an MBA or something like that to make it truly unique so that when you write content and you start to link that and build that authorship profile, 
you're not competing with every other Stephen Miller out there in the world, right? So this is more of a branding issue than it is an SEO issue, but it really is really crosses both spectrums there. Use the same email address. Just said that. Make sure you use your same email address. Complete it. Like anything else, if you don't have a, if you have an incomplete profile, you're not going to get the max out of it. I already talked about linking to them together in a nice loop. Set up on many, as many platforms as you can. I use a tool called designer.io to make the publishing of an ebook extremely easy. I could take this entire piece of content right here, which is a substantial piece of content. It's over 5,000 words, I think, 4,000 words. Yeah, 4,500 words right now. I could take this and turn it into an ebook in a couple of clicks and maybe about five minutes using Designer. Okay, so that's a really cool tool. If you haven't used it before, highly recommend it. And then get an ISBN assigned to your ebook. An ISBN is a unique number for your book. And you can, there's a link to how to get that ISBN here. It's from myidentifiers.com. But an ISBN will help with SEO. And it also helps with just get, making sure your book is unique with its own ISBN. I always launch a press release for every piece of content we publish. That's just part of our SEO campaigns every single month. We got content, but we're going to amplify that content, not just by putting it on a blog. We're going to amplify that content by RS feeding it through IFT to a set of syndicated authorship accounts. And we're going to send a press release out about it to amplify it in that respect. All right. I think that is it. Yes. So let's go. Are there any other questions here before I go into a couple of quick demos? Yeah, we're uh, 50 10 minutes, minutes in. Lane. I just wanted to give you a little heads up. It's 11, yep. 11, 50 minutes in. All right. So we got 10 minutes here. Let me just show you guys in links and how I'm starting to use it with chat GPT. So in links and on page AI are very similar. They're, they are, they all both have their own unique features that I really like uniquely. I hate having redundancy in tools because I hate paying for tools that are really similar. So I don't know whether I'm going to keep in links yet. I really like on page AI so far, but I've the more I use in links, the more I start to look at as well. So I may keep both. But you can run just like you can an on page AI. I can run a query and then it's going to give me all this different intelligence around that keyword in terms of what needs to be in my content. Now in links is going to do the same thing, but if you go to content plan. Once it's drilling that keyword, you see this new thing here called chat GPT prompt. I can click on it and it gives me a bunch of prompts about this keyword that I need to have in my content based on the entities and related words that need to be in that content based on what's already ranking. Okay, so there's that's where some of that crossover with on-page AI exists. But these chat GPT prompts are really cool. So I can copy this here and I can go right over to chat GPT and I can copy it here and I can let it drill. Okay. And so rather than doing it all live here and taking up time, what I did here is I went through and I copied each of these. Okay. And I went here and you can see it's already rewriting us here, but I already have it saved. So if you go, we go up here all the way to the top, you can see here's my first prompt. Write an article about Google Eat, start with a title introduction include blah 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 right and so let chat gpt do its thing and here it writes now i took the second prompt from in links add a section about guidelines start with a section title right here it is now you can add your own words in here too so what i did is i started taking words that i didn't see in in links like these words here but i knew they were related to guidelines and i was using on page ai category or entity level words related words and I was just adding those into the prompts so that I would get more in there and I would start to actually use both tools to produce even better content. Now, if I copied and pasted all this into a page and published it and ran through the on-page AI detection, it would come back 100% AI detected content. I don't feel comfortable with that, although I've read this and all this is really good answers. Like it's really good. So what I want to do and what I've done in this article here is I've just taken all these prompts and different pieces of content, and I have, I've written in my, in my own article that passes the tools I've already shown you. So this is how you can use in links or on page AI to create even more comprehensive in-depth content that really hits the mark.
And then this new text tool that I'm using uh, here, Cort Text Cortex. So you can see it's running down here in the bottom, okay? I can open Creator Suite. And so I can take a prompt or some content from, from ChatGPT, and I can take this and I can have it rewritten by Text Cortex right here and hit Create. And they have different type of templates. And so you can take a couple of different tools and create your own unique content from it and just make sure it's really accurate. But I found this to be extremely helpful in framing out within links. I did the drill. It really gave me the entire section for my content plan right here. I let chat GPT tool really frame it out for me with the, the content there. And then I just started to curate it, human review it, curate it, rework it. And ultimately rework it until I felt comfortable with the on-page AI detection output as a final score. Can so, you scroll down on that, Elaine? What, is the, what does the brief look like here in... Here? Yes. Oh, I, so, okay. Yeah, you have to build your brief there. I just um, wondered if on, on the on-page tool one, if it had... No, it probably doesn't have one if you put the page in. It doesn't okay. do like the in links does a better job of building out a content brief and a content plan okay. without any doubt. And that for that purpose, I really like it. Some spectacular content briefs out of online or on page AI. Yes. Uh, and you can see here more, the more outputs that in links gives you. And it's very similar. Like I said, there's good crossover here, but there are some unique features about both that I really like. I think combining it with the text cortex component. I really like it. I just think that this can help even produce even some more original content or what have you. If you don't use on-page AI, what do I re recommend for AI detection? I haven't used Glitter yet, but this is a free tool. And so you can use the Glitter free tool to and experiment with it. I haven't even used it yet. So I just found it today in my research, but this is at least a free tool that you can experiment with. Yeah, Stephen says in the chat that ChatGPT is very repetitive, and one of the things you need to do is go in and clean it out, and that's absolutely true. Yes, and it's one of the ways that they detect AI content is through the use of the word, the way you start your sentences, whether it's the or I or whatever. And so, making sure that it looks like it's written by a human is really important. Of course, we've been saying all along that we need human intervention on all of this content. Raphael says, can you edit the outline briefs in InLinks? Yeah, you can create your own brief over here, content plan, and then really build it out as a project. Yeah, you can build it right in here. You can build it in on-page AI. You can build it in a Google document and just combine the intelligence from both. Obviously, you can see here, I can, I, the nice thing you can do here is, although it, it gives you the same kind of drill, but I can just click here and boom, it adds it right into my brief. I can say here, I want my H1 to be that. Well, I did that there but I want my H2. And then, so you can really quickly and easily start to build out your brief in on-page AI, like Lynn was talking. I love both of these tools. I'm definitely not getting rid of the on-page AI because I've become, I just have fallen in love with using it for many different reasons in this new world of content. In links, I really like this chat GPT prompt and I like some of the way that they drill as well. And then this new text cortex Chrome extension I'm experimenting with as well. Yeah, Chris says it seems like it might be easier to just use human writers from the start. And that might be true. Might I would say true. that these tools aren't for everyone. I give my writing team options and they use them to certain levels of what, where they're comfortable. At the end of the day, we all have to create great content that's built for humans. And so me personally, I need the prompts. I don't know that I'm always as thoughtful of it getting my words on paper as the things that are in my head. So I like to use them as the prompts to get yeah. some concepts and ideas. But certainly having great writers is important too, because you have to know what's good content and what isn't. So I will tell you that the biggest challenge our writers have, it's we put out a lot of content every month for our SEO campaigns. It's the number one, it's the biggest piece of everything we do. I, it's so important that I hired a full-time quality assurance manager just to read and review every single article before it goes to our agencies and then our clients or their clients. But the biggest challenge our writers have is like month six, month nine, month 15 of a campaign. Like how many different ways can I talk about plumbing in a piece of content, right? And so it's, you start to get stale as a writer and you start to figure out or have challenges with coming up with new ideas. And so what Lynn is saying, I agree with a hundred percent. It's a really good tool 
to help spawn some new ideas and just get some new content going. And then I agree with Chris's comment that in many ways, let the writer just write and not try to get too hung up with all these different tools. I'm experimenting with these tools and exposing them to you guys because this is a new frontier. And the question is, can we use these tools to make even better content and potentially save some time? I know for sure the tools are already helping our writers with ideas. The on-page AI tool is really good for writing because I can do a drill on a target keyword, get a lot of intelligence and things that I can swipe and include. Um, and so from a writing standpoint, like this really helps the writer just frame on an article and then go um, um, without using chat GPT at all. A quick example. We hired a girl to write for us. She was, uh, she had a JD in law from Tulane. She's a great writer. Husband was a doctor. They moved around a lot. She just wanted something to do. And she was writing for us and brilliant, a young girl and a great writer. And the first piece of content I assigned to her was to write an article about lawn fertilization. And you and I could read that article and it looked great. I threw it in one of these tools and she never used the word green or the word grass in the entire article. <laughs> Something that a, as humans, we didn't catch, but it was a great article about lawn fertilization, but she never talked about green, having green grass, never used either of those words in the content. And so having tools like this for us, is just a good reminder. Hey, you probably should talk about this if you want to rank in Google, Google knows what words should be in writing, in, con in content, and in articles. And I would argue that writing a con piece of content about lawn fertilization and not mentioning grass or the word green probably lends to less helpful content. 100% agreed, Lynn. That's a really good point. And remember, guys, I, my article here that I'm scoring here started out at zero. Started out at zero. And I'm now, I've got a piece of content that from an SEO standpoint has is hitting all the marks. And so to Lynn's point, these, I agree, there was, I wrote this whole article and then there was like, I missed like links, I think didn't exist in the article, 4,000 words and the word links didn't exist. Like what? But we could write really helpful content and just miss a lot of words that will just add more depth and relevancy. And that's the key word here is green grass is highly relevant to lawn fertilization. And if you're not including green grass in, a in an article about lawn fertilization, you are hurting your relevancy. How much? That's, that's up for debate. But your article is going to be more relevant just by including those two extra words. Yeah. All right. We're going to we're going to cap it here. Mike says, how does on-page AI compare with Surfer for SEO terms and scores that actually match up with Google Ring? I find it to be far superior in every way. I canceled Surfer SEO two months ago or three months ago, once I was confident with what I was getting from on-page AI. So that's my own opinion, but we are no longer using Pop or Surfer. I'm using on-page AI exclusive. I don't even use SEM Rush anymore. I used to use SEM Rush for a lot of my content research as well, because it, it has some really good tools as well. I just find that on-page AI gives me everything I needed that I was getting from SEM Rush and or Surfer in a, with more intelligence, more data, and a better NLP engine scan as well. So I'm this last graph here, and then we'll close with this, is the, let me just make it a little bit smaller here so we can see the whole, is a competitor analysis of the top 10 pages and then how I'm scoring. And it's looking at the Google NLP engine to see what entities do I have in my content versus those that are, in the are on page one. And I can literally visually just line my article up and see how am I doing? And you can see how my article is better. And it gives me these words that I'm missing still. So I can go back in there and add online marketing, online traffic and analytics and get rid of my reds. And no other page ranking in the on page one is has all green or doesn't have any red. So these visual cues also really help, I think, from just writing a better optimized piece of content. Everyone, I want to thank you for uh, just your time today. I hope this was helpful. If you would like a copy of our slide deck, all I would ask you is that you just post something about what you learned today or some maybe a good review or testimonial from today's session, so either in LinkedIn or Facebook, and tag me and tag me and Lynn if you can both. But if you tag me, I will then get, send you a, the copy of the slide deck as soon as I, I get tagged in one of those posts. There's a lot of, there's hours and hours of time that go into 
these classes and the preparation and the research and these slide decks, I'm trying to make them into a really useful tool and resource for all of you. And so if you found value in what we went through today, just give us a quick mention. It helps us build some momentum online to get more people to come to these classes. And I'll be happy to share the research and tool that, came, that went into today's slide deck. Lynn, anything else you want to leave our audience with? No, I don't think so. The last thing I'll probably do is if you guys got some value from this, just drop one in the chat, let Lane know and let us know that this was helpful. We want to continue to make these helpful. We want to continue to bring you cutting edge technology. We want to keep you focused on the fundamentals also. And so we're, we're really hoping to just continue to build this out. And as we grow, these will get better and better. Thank awesome. You. Thank you so much for the feedback. Lynn, thank you for being an awesome co-host. I really enjoy these sessions with you and just super honored and humbled to be able to co-host this with you. Same with me. You did an amazing job once again. Looking forward to seeing you guys on the next one. And we'll, we're going to come up with another great topic. We'll let you know. Awesome. Last Tuesday of every month, 12 p.m. Eastern. So I don't even actually have the date for January, but the last Tuesday in January, 12 p.m. Eastern. Again, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year to everyone. Hope you have a really productive week and just usher in 2023 with a bang. Super appreciate all of you. Have a great week. We'll talk to you again next month. Thank you. Thanks, Lane. See you.